Hi friends, welcome back. In today's video, I'm going to discuss data structures, interview questions. Uh, so I, I made it a point like I cover all the topics from the data structures. Uh, I covered the linear data structures like linked lists, tags, queues, and hash tables, and the nonlinear data structures like graphs and trees. And also I covered the topics of uh, sorting techniques and searching techniques. So without further uh, ado, let us get started. So what is a data structure? So this would be the basic question in an interview. So what is a data structure? So a data structure is basically a group of data elements that are put together under one name and which defines a particular way of storing and organizing data in a computer so that it can be used efficiently. In order to write efficient programs, we need to apply certain data management techniques. And these techniques are nothing but data structures. It is not a programming language. To implement the data structures, we need programming languages like C++, C++ Java, Python, et cetera. So data structures is like uh, the related data plus the allowed operations on that data. So which is nothing but the data structure. For example, uh, uh, the photos in the gallery, your, your phone gallery are stored with the help of data structures. So this is the definition of the data structure. Mm -hmm. What are data structures primarily used for? The data structures are widely used in uh, almost every aspect of computer science, especially so I just have put some applications over here. So they're used in uh, operating systems, they're used in compiler design. They're also used in artificial intelligence and graphics, uh, statistical analysis package, lexical analysis, numerical computation and database handling. Uh, so in operating systems, uh, data structures are used for scheduling the algorithm, scheduling the processes. Um, they're used in the scheduling algorithms and uh, in compiler design, like data structures are used to maintain the symbol table and all that. And in database ha uh, handling, like in DBMS, data structures are used to, to model the data. So these are uh, some of the uh, areas where the data structures are applied. So what are the data structures used in database management system? Uh, so they're used to model the data. Uh, so to implement the network data model, uh, so the graph data structures are used and to implement the hierarchical data models, tree data structures are used and to implement relational database management system headers are used. So the relational database management system is uh, a table. Uh, so with the rows and columns in it, so these are called as the rows and these are called as the columns. So relational database management system is implemented by using an array. Uh, so let us move to the next question. So the next question is what are the applications of the data structures uh, to implement uh, the undo operation in the text editor? Uh, so we use the data structures uh, to, to store information about files and directories in the system, we use the data structures to store dynamically growing data, which is accessed very frequently based upon a key value pair, we use the data structure to implement that functionality in the web browser. So we have the forward and backward buttons in the browser, right? Uh, so that backward and forward buttons are implemented by using the linker list. And uh, these are some of the applications of the data structures. What is an abstract data type? So an abstract data type, which is also called as an ADT, is the way we look at the data structure, focusing on what it does and ignoring how it does its job. So let us separate it. Uh, so abstract, uh, let us separate these uh, things into two parts. The first one is abstract and the next one is the data type. So what is abstraction? Abstraction is hiding uh, certain details, implementation details from the end user. So when we hide, we only show the methods and how the user can use the methods. Uh, so for example, if a person is going to an ATM center, so in the ATM center, the person will be using the methods such as balance inquiry, and the person will be using uh, withdraw amount and all that. So those are methods, but the person do not know how what happens as soon as he clicks on the withdraw and how it, how it performs the job, it is not uh, uh, important for the user. He just need to know how to use the ATM machine. So that is called as an abstraction. 
And uh, here, uh, uh, abstract data types means that, for example, you take an example of a stack. So the user uh, just need to know how to, what operations that he can perform on a stack, like the push operation and the pop operation. So he just need to know how to use this push and how to use this pop. And what is the functionality of push and pop? Like for pushing is like inserting data into the stack and pop is removing the data from the stack, that's it. Uh, he needn't know like uh, how it does the push, push operation and how it does the pop operation. So such kind of things are called as an abstract data type. So the end user is not concerned about how the methods carry out the task, but they're concerned about the available methods and calling the methods for getting results. Uh, so I just gave you an example of a stack where the user should only know uh, that there are push and pop methods to operate on the data, but they should not know how push operation is carried out. So these are called as abstract data types. What is meant by a good program? So we can say that a program consists of an algorithm plus the data structures. Uh, so what is a good program? So a program uh, is the set of instructions that we write to achieve a particular task. So the program should run correctly, meaning that it should produce a correct results. You intended to um, write a program to generate prime numbers, then the program should generate prime numbers only. It should not generate Fibonacci series. Then it means that the program is not correct. So the program should run correctly, meaning that it should produce a correct results. What it was intended, um, it should produce that results only. And uh, the program should be easy to read and write. And you also can make modifications to the program easily. And the program can be yeah, easily debugged. Uh, so these are the uh, qualities that a good program should possess. What is meant by an efficient program? So let us look into this. Uh, so the primary goal of any program or software is to perform operations along with storing and retrieving information. And this storing and retrieving information should be done as fast as possible. So that uh, efficient means that you are able to retrieve and store the information um, in a less time and with the minimum space, uh, memory space. So that is called as efficiency. A program is said to be efficient when it executes in minimum time and with the minimum memory space. Uh, so to do that, what we have to do is to improve the efficiency of the program, you need to select an appropriate data structure over here. So the appropriate data structure needs to be chosen so that you can improve the efficiency of the program. Uh, uh, for the problem, uh, is a, th this choosing of the data structure is the crucial decision and that will have a major impact on the performance. If you are choosing the wrong data structure, uh, then there is chances that uh, your the efficiency of the program will drop down. What are time and space complexities? Uh, so to measure the efficiency of a program or to measure the uh, algorithms efficiency, you have two uh, parameters over here. The first parameter is the time parameter and the next one is the space parameter. So there are uh, uh, two measures to analyze an algorithm to determine the amount of resources such as time and space needed to execute the program. So what is time complexity? Time complexity of an algorithm is basically the running time of the program. Okay, so it is the time taken for the program to finish, to execute. And then the space complexity of an algorithm is the amount of computer memory that is required during the program execution as a function of the input size. Uh, space and time complexities were very prominent in um, uh, in 1970s and 60s and all that, because uh, in those days, like one GB was very costly and today's space complexity is not so prominent, uh, but time complexity is important in today's uh, uh, generation. Uh, what is uh, worst case, average case, and the best case? Uh, so the worst case denotes behavior of algorithm with respect to the worst possible case of input instance. Um, Knowing worst case assures us that the algorithm will never go beyond this uh, time limit. It is the upper bound on the running time of the algorithm. 
So the maximum time taken for the program to execute is considered to be the worst case. And when you say maximum, it means that you can be sure once you have the maximum time required uh, for the program to complete, then you can be sure that uh, for any kind of input other than the worst uh, kind of input, you can be sure that it will be less than less than this maximum time. Uh, so the average case is the estimate of an algorithm for the average input, for any random input other than the worst uh, input. And next is the best case. Best case is the analysis of the algorithm in optimal <laughs> conditions. That is the minimum number of steps performed to draw the results. Uh, for example, I can give you an example with the linear uh, uh, search over here. Uh, so the best case in the linear search is an operation which is uh, 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 performed by comparing with the target element with each and every element of uh, the list uh, from the beginning. Uh, so for example, say that I'm having the, the list like this one, 11, 20, 32, and 55, and uh, I want to search. So the target element is uh, one. I want to search whether one is there in, the, in this list or not. Uh, so I compare one with one. So what happened here is with the first uh, uh, a search itself in, in, the, in the first comparison itself I found the element. So this is the best case. So what is the best input? The best input is uh, uh, the input that is uh, uh, that matches with the first element of uh, the list. Now coming to the worst case, worst case means that I want to search for 55 or I want to search for another element which is not there in the list. Okay, so that is considered to be the worst case. It's a kind of input wherein the, the maximum number of operations are performed. And average case is picking up any 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 one of this, okay, like 11 or 22 or 32, that is the average case. Uh, so any algorithm is measured in terms of worst case, average case, and the best case. So the categories of algorithms based on running time. Uh, so here you can say that if an algorithm is taking the uh, uh, constant time, then you say that it is a constant time algorithm and meaning that the running time of the algorithm or the time complexity is order of uh, one. And linear time complexity, uh, if an algorithm is taking uh, linear time, then you call that as linear time algorithm and the time complexity of the algorithm will be order of n. Then logarithmic algorithms are the algorithms which will take log n time. And polynomial algorithms are which will take uh, um, n power k time, where uh, k is greater than one. And exponential algorithms are something which will take two power n time over here. Uh, so the efficient ones uh, are like uh, uh, order of one, order of n, and order of uh, um, uh, log n. All these are efficient and exponential time complexities and polynomial, they take more time to execute. So an algorithm should be uh, should be in these three things, okay? It can be constant or linear or logarithmic. You need to better the algorithm to make it logarithmic or linear and linear logarithmic. There is something over here, which is also called as linear logarithmic, which would be like order of n log n, okay? So your sorting algorithms, like your heap sort and quick sort and all that, have the time complexity of n log n. So, which is called as linear logarithmic time complexity. So, these are the categories of algorithms based on the running time. What is meant by data? Uh, so, here in data structures, so we are saying we are talking about data, data, right? Uh, so, what is data? The term data means a value or set of values. Okay, it's a value or set of values. That is a value of a variable or a constant. So, let me give you the example of what is a data. So it can be the marks of a student or it is name of an employee or address of a customer or the value of five, this is a constant, right? 3.14. So anything is considered to be a data. And how we organize it is the point over here, the management of this data. And what is meant by a record? So uh, a record is a collection of data items. Uh, so say for example, so this is the name. Uh, so this is the name and this is the address. Uh, and this is the course, and uh, this is the marks. Okay, so you can say that name, address, course, and marks, all these are considered to be the fields. Uh, and uh, this uh, 
collection of the data items, right? For the name, it is Sudha, and for address, it is Bimbara, and course, BPEC, and RCP. So this thing is considered to be a, a row, right? And the row is nothing but your record. We call this as a record, or in DBMS, we call this as a tuple. And uh, these group together form the record. So what is meant by a file? A file is collection of records. Okay, so for example, in the previous case, we saw this, right? So again, I'm having another student's uh, record. Uh, say for example, I have X, Y, Z and something, and we take and something, and another student over here. So I can have another student, say Shika, and okay, some Vijayvada and some course and this thing. Okay, so the group of records together will form your file. The collection, a file is a collection of records. Uh, example, say that there are 60 students in a class, then there will be 60 records of a student and all these related uh, records are stored in a file. Uh, so we say that it's an employee file or we say that it's a customer file. All the information pertaining to a customer, you can make it as a customer file in the employee file. All the employees in an organization details will be there in the employee file. So this is a file collection of records. What is the difference between primitive and non-primitive data structures? Uh, so here, the primitive data structures, also called as the basic data types, are the fundamental data types which support uh, support which are supported by the programming languages. Example, int, float, double, char. So they are supported by like different uh, programming languages have support different data types. So those are called as the primitive data structures, or we also call it as the primitive data types. And non-primitive data structures are created using primitive data types. Example, link list, stack, trees, graphs, queues, all these are the non-primitive data structures. Okay, primitive data structures are the built-in ones. Like uh, you have this int, float, char, double, and uh, all that, uh, long, all these are the built-in ones. They come along with the programming language. You just need to use it. Non-primitive data structures are the one like you create them. Okay, so they are like linked list, et cetera. Uh, so what is the types of non-primitive data structures? Uh, so there are two uh, categories over here. The first one is the linear data structures and the second one is the non-linear data structures. You can also say that there are two types of data structures. There are two types of data structures. One is the linear data structure and the other one is the non-linear data structure. What are non what are linear data structures? So linear data structures are those where the elements are stored in linear or sequential order. So the linear data structures can be re represented in memory in two ways. So the first one is linear relationship between the elements by sequential memory locations or contiguous memory locations. Like how you do it in arrays, right? Arrays are contiguous memory locations. They're continuous memory locations. And uh, another way to represent uh, the linear data structures is like uh, uh, having uh, nodes and linking them, okay? So the linear relationship between elements by means of links. Links are nothing but pointers, okay? So these are nothing but pointers. They're uh, single level. Uh, so linear data structures are all single level and easy to implement. Uh, this single level means that, uh, uh, for example, you take uh, trees. Trees are multi-level. So you have different levels. Uh, in each and every level, you have different set of data uh, stored. But here in linear data structures, they are single level and they're easy to implement. Uh, so what is linear data structure? Are those where the elements are stored in linear or sequential order. So let us look into the examples of linear data structures. The examples of linear data structures are arrays, linked list, tag, queue, and hash tables. Uh, then what are non-linear data structures? If the elements of the data structures are not stored in sequential order, then they are called as non-linear data structures. The relationship of adjacency is not maintained over here uh, in the non-linear data structures. And memory utilization is efficient in non-linear data structures. They are generally multi-level and they're difficult to implement. So this uh, means that it is non-linear data structure. When the sequential order is not maintained, then we say that they are non-linear data structures. Uh, so examples of non-linear data structures are trees, graphs, and twice. What is an array? 
array is a collection of similar or homogeneous data elements. Uh, the elements in the array will have the same data type. If you want to store the integer ones, uh, uh, then the all the elements inside the array will be of integer type only. The elements are stored in consecutive memory locations, and uh, each and every element is referred with an index, which is called as a subscript. Index starts with zero in C and Java. That is the first element is found at index uh, zero. Okay, say for example, uh, this is the syntax of how you create an array uh, in C programming. So I say data type, then uh, I'll give the name of the array and then the size. So here the data type is in and this marks is the name of the array and this 10 is the size of the array, meaning that the indexes will be from zero to nine. Okay, so the first element will be found at the uh, uh, first index, like marks zero, I'll be getting the first uh, uh, students marks or whatever okay and marks the first the for second element will be found at one okay so the indexes are uh, generally st starts from zero in c programming so this is an array it's a collection of similar homogeneous data elements what are the limitations of an array uh, the first limitation is that arrays are fixed size like you cannot grow uh, uh, you cannot uh, grow or shrink the size of the array uh, based on the requirement. Uh, so it's a fixed size, like you need to mention it beforehand. So in the previous case, I said int, um, and then I said uh, marks, right? I said int marks, and then I said 10. So here I have fixed it, meaning that I can only enter 10 marks only. In case if I want to enter two more marks, it's not possible because the array is of fixed size. So what we generally do is, uh, so in case if we don't know how many, uh, what is the size of the array beforehand, we try to fix it more. Like for example, I will fix it for 50 and say that uh, the array size to be 50. For example, I fixed the array size to be 50. And, but I'm giving only 10 student marks over here. Then what happened? The rest of the 40 locations are going as a waste. So there is a lot of memory wastage in uh, the array because the memory is wasted if you don't know the exact elements beforehand. Uh, that's because we presume, uh, presume the size, okay? So here we are saying like, maybe it will be 40 elements or maybe it will be 50 elements. So in that cases, the memory will be wasted. And data elements are stored in continuous memory locations. Uh, so say, for example, I want uh, for integer, it is four uh, bytes and I want 10 uh, elements. So it needs 40 bytes of consecutive memory allocation and maybe 40 bytes of contiguous memory is not available. Uh, so there can be because of the contiguous memory allocation, it, it can be a possible for uh, uh, for the operating system to allocate the memory. And that is also another limitation of an array. Insertion and deletion of elements can be uh, problematic or it can be um, lengthy, inefficient because of shifting of the elements from their positions. So to insert an element in the middle, like for example, I'm having one, two, three, four, and five, and I want to insert an element in between two and three, then what happens is I need to shift all these to the right. Okay, so insertion and deletions uh, will be uh, inefficient in an array because you need to shift all the elements. That's the case with the deletion also. Say you want to delete this three, you have to shift this four to the three position and then five to the four position. So that shiftings will be there. So which is an inefficient way. What are the applications of an array? Uh, the applications are like uh, 2D arrays, which are known as the matrices. Uh, can be used in image processing. So arrays are used. So even though it has got the limitations that I have mentioned in the previous slide, um, it has got certain its own applications. It's suitable for many other uh, applications like this. And it is also used in uh, speech processing. Uh, then uh, it is also used in uh, uh, putting the, arranging the leaderboard of a game, like uh, uh, by simply implementing it to an array to store the score and arrange them in descending order to clearly make out the rank of the student. Okay, and then the question paper uh, is an array of numbered questions. So arrays are implemented, they have got their own applications and arrays are also used to, uh, to implement the heap sort because this is the best way to do that. This is an, again another application of an array. Okay, fine.
what are the advantages of an array? Okay, the advantages of an array are like accessing an element is very easy by using the index number. Uh, because the array support both random access and uh, also sequential access. How it supports random access? I can directly go to, for example, A is the name of the array. I can directly go to the 21st index. Okay, and uh, uh, this is one of the advantages of an array where it supports random access. And uh, to, the search process can be applied to an array very easily. And uh, two-dimensional array is used to represent matrices. And for any reason a user wishes to store multiple values of similar type, then array can be used and utilized efficiently. So these are all the advantages of an array. What are type of arrays? Uh, there are three different kinds of an array. The first one is indexed array, and the second one is multidimensional array, and the third one is associative arrays. What are multidimensional arrays? Multidimensional arrays are arrays that span across more than one dimension. Uh, so they will have more than one index value for every point of storage. And these are used in cases like data cannot be represented using one dimension. In the matrix, the two dimensional array. So you have rows and columns and you have two indexes, two subscripts to represent a particular element. So the first subscript is used to represent the row and the second subscript is used to represent the column. So say, for example, I'm saying A, one and one, meaning that I want the element at the first row, first column. And multidimensional arrays are extension of two dimensional matrices and use additional subscript for indexing. So you can have three dimensional arrays, you can have four dimensions. So you can have how many other dimensions you want, you can extend it. What are associative arrays? Uh, so these are a collection of key value pairs where we can insert a value with a specific key and search for a value given its key. Uh, these are also called as maps, dictionaries or associative arrays. Uh, so this is an example of an associative array where you can find that these are nothing but the keys and these are the values. So it is a key value pair, okay? Uh, so I'll be searching this uh, Visak Patnam, I'll be getting this Visak Patnam with a key, which is VTZ. So these are associative arrays. What's the difference between static array and dynamic array? Static arrays are allocated memory at compiled time and the size is fixed and located in stack memory space. And this is how you declare a static array. So int the name of the array and then the size. Size here is 10. Now coming to the dynamic arrays. Dynamic arrays are created at runtime and the size is not fixed and located in heap memory space. And uh, this is how you create a dynamic array. In uh, this is what I'm showing you in Java. So I said int star array is equal to, array is the name of the array. And uh, by using the new, I will be creating the memory at the runtime and said int and 10. So you can also create dynamic uh, arrays in C programming by using the dynamic memory allocation concept by using malloc, by using malloc, calloc and all that, you can create dynamic memories in uh, C programming. What are dragged arrays? So jagged array is an array of arrays such that member arrays can be of different sizes. So we can create a two-dimensional array, but with a variable name, variable number of columns, okay? So say, for example, here I'm having three rows, okay? So this is the first row, and this is the second row, and this is the third row. But you can see that the columns in the first row, there are four columns in the first row, and there are six columns in the second row, and there are uh, two columns in the third row. Such kind of arrays are called as jagged arrays. What is symbol table and data structure used to implement it? A symbol table is an important data structure created and maintained by the compiler. So why it is maintained? In order to keep track of semantics of a variable. What do you mean by semantics of a variable? It stores information about the scope and binding information uh, about names, names information about instances of various entities such as variables, function names, classes, and objects. So to maintain the symbol table, uh, we'll be using a data structure which is called as hash table. Data structure used to implement symbol tables is the hash table. What is a pointer? 
uh, the pointer in C is a variable that stores address of another variable. So pointer is just a variable which will store the address of another variable. A pointer can be incremental, decremental, uh, to point to the next previous memory locations. So it also points to, it can increment to point to the next location and decrement to point to the previous memory location. The purpose of pointer is to save memory space and achieve faster execution time. So these are the advantages of a pointer. What is a linked list? Linked list is a linear data structure. So we saw this in the categories of the data structure. A linked list is a flexible dynamic data structure in which elements are uh, also called as nodes form a sequential list, which connects elements called nodes through links or pointers. So I gave you an example of a linked list here. So this entire part over here is considered to be a node. And the node is having two compartments. The first one is the data part, and the next one is the link, which will be holding the address of the next node. So you can see that the address of the next node is 4900, and it is holding, this is a pointer. As we already saw in the previous case, this is a pointer, which will be holding the address of the next node. So this link here is a pointer. And, uh, here you can see a special node which is a header so this head or start you can also say that this is a start will hold the address of the first node so you can see that address of the first node is 4800 which is there in the head and likewise the second node will be holding the address of the third node so you can see 5000 is here and 3000 is here okay and coming to the last node so here there is a chain you can see that there is a chain of, of links over here or pointers and uh, which is nothing but the sequential list this is a sequential list uh, why we call this as a sequential list is you cannot directly go to this node for example, I want to go to this particular node. I cannot go to this node. I can only start from this particular first node. And from the first node, I can go to the second node. And from the second node, only I can go to the third node. This is what is called a sequential list. And coming to the last node, uh, this is the last node. It do not have the next node. So the pointer will be holding a null over here, meaning that there is no node and this is the last node. So this is a linked list. So let us compare the linked list with an array. Uh, so these are all the strengths or the advantages of the array and these are the advantages of the linked list. So let us look into what are the strengths of an array. So random access is the strength of an array and less memory needed per element because we don't have pointers here, right? So only the data part is there in the array. So memory, uh, less memory needed compared to the linked list and better cache locality that you get with the array. And coming to the strengths of the linked list, uh, fast insertion, the deletion and uh, insertion takes very less time compared to an array. And then it is dynamically, it grows and shrinks dynamically and uh, efficient memory allocation and utilization. And coming to the weaknesses uh, of the array, so slow insertion and deletion, fixed size is a drawback and inefficient memory allocation and utilization. And coming to the linked list, uh, so we can see that slow search time, because I already told you, you cannot go to the third node or the fourth node directly. You can only start from the beginning of the uh, linked list. From the first node only, you can start searching the nodes. Uh, so more memory needed per node as additional storage required for pointers. Uh, then uh, arrays uh, do support random and sequential access. Uh, linked lists do not uh, support random access. They support linear access only. So you can start only from the beginning of the uh, linked list. And arrays can store homogeneous data and linked lists can store heterogeneous data. So it is a structure. So you it can have integer, float, and all kinds of data it can store. So these are the differences between linked list and array. Applications of linked list. Uh, so the first application of linked list is to represent a polynomial, uh, a coefficient. So the node over here will be having two parts. The first part is the coefficient part and the second one is the part. So here the term of a polynomial can be represented as a node, which will be holding the 
coefficient and the power. Uh, so the next application is images are linked with each other. An image viewer software uses a linker list. And web pages can be accessed using previous and next uh, URL links, which are linked using the linker list. So you can see that web pages, uh, from one web page, you can go to another web page and all that, and the previous also. So linker lists are, maintained, uh, are used there. And a music player where you can go to the next music or next uh, uh, song or, or the previous song. So to keep track of turns in the multiplayer uh, uh, environment, a circular linker list is used. So these are the applications of linker list. What is a node in linker list? So as I already told you, in order to form a linker list, we need a structure which is called as a node. And this node has got two fields. The first field is the data field and the next one is the next field. So you can see this is the data field and this is the next field. The data field is used to store the information part. So say the marks of a student, 90. So this is the data part. And uh, the next field will be holding the address of the next node. Uh, so that is a pointer. So you can see that uh, uh, the next field is used to store the address of the next node in the sequence, which is a pointer. And the start and head is a node used to store the address of the first node. Uh, so this is a node of a linker list. So what are the types of uh, linker lists? Uh, so let me show you them. Uh, so the first type is the single linker list. And the single linker list is this where uh, uh, you can only traverse in one direction, okay? So I can only go into the forward direction, meaning that I can start with the first node. From the first node, I can go to the next node. And from the next node, I go to the next node, and that's it. From this particular third node, say, for example, I'm here, I cannot go to this particular node because I do not have a link to go to the previous node. So you can understand that a linker list, single linker list, what does it mean by single? Single means that only one link. So this will be having only one link. What is this link? The link is nothing but to the next node. So I don't have a link to the previous node. I'll just have one link and that node, that link will be to the next node. Now coming to the doubly linker list, doubly linker list will be having two links. Okay, so why we say that it is double, double means two, right? Double means two. Two means I'm having two links. Okay, so what are the two links over here? The first is to the previous node and the next one is to the next node. So since I'm having two links, Forward and also the backward movements are possible in the double linker list. I can go uh, uh, from one node to the next node, and also I can go to the previous node also. Say I'm here in the second node. From the second node, I can go to the next node by using the next link over here, and I can go to the previous node by using the previous link over here. So two-way traversal is possible in the double linker list, whereas only forward traversal is possible in the single linker list. Now coming to the circular linker list, it's a form of a single linker list, but the only difference, so these two are connected, okay, circular linker list and single linker list are connected, wherein the only difference between single and circular linker list is that here you can see in the single linker list, the node, last node is having null in it, meaning that there is no next node and it has stopped over here. Now, coming to the circular linker list, the last node will not have a null over here. It will have the address of the first node. So this last node over here is holding the address of the first node. What is the address of the first node? 100, right? So it is holding 100 over here. So meaning that from the last node, you can come back to the first node. In single linker list, you cannot do that. Once you are to the last node, that's it. It's over. You cannot come to the first node. But using the circular linker list from the last node, you can come back to the first node. Because the last node will be holding the address of the first node. Next type is the doubly circular linker list. Okay, so here it is two combination of two linker lists. The first one is it is a doubly linker list as well as it has got the quality of the circular linker list. So this is a circular linker list. So doubly linker list wherein there are two links, you can see that there is a previous link and the next link. And also the last node is holding the address of the previous node, meaning that the address of the first node, okay? And the first node is holding the address of the last node. 
So this is called as the doubly circular linker list. So how many types of linker lists are there? Four types of linker lists are there. The first one is the single linker list. Second one is double linker list. Third one is circular linker list. And the fourth variety is doubly circular linker list. So let us compare doubly linker list with single linker list. Now, single linker list that contains nodes which have a data field and next field, which points to the next node in the line of the nodes. So here you are having in the double linker list, you will be having the data field. Along with the data field, you are having next field and previous field. So the next field will point to the next node and the previous field will point to the previous node in the sequence. So this is uh, the definitions of the single linker list and double linker list. Allows traversal in one direction through the elements. It allows traversal in both the direction, forward and the backward direction. And single linker list requires less memory as because it's storing only one address. Now coming to the double linker list, it requires more memory compared to the single linker list because there are two links, two addresses. Complexity of insertion and deletion at known position is order of n. And the complexity of insertion and deletion at known position is order of one. So in double linker list, it is order of one because you can move forward and backward. You can go to any of the nodes. So it takes constant time. Operations performed on linker list. What are the various operations that you can perform on the linker list? The first one is traversing a linker list, searching the value in a linker list, inserting the node in a linker list. So these are all the kinds of insertions that you can do. Insert a node at the beginning, at the end, after a given node, before a given node. And delete operation, deleting a node from the linker list. And these are all the variants of the delete, like delete the first node, last node, delete node after a given node, and delete node before a given node. So these are all the operations performed on a linker list. Data structures that is used to implement LRU cache. So to implement an LRU cache, we use two data structures. The first one is a hash map and a doubly linker list. A doubly linker list helps in maintaining the eviction order and a hash map helps with the order of one lookups of cache keys. C code to create a node in a single linker list. So this is how you create a node in a single linker list. So you say struct and then node. So this is a name given to this struct type, so which is node. And inside it, you're having like, I'm having an int data. So this is the data field. And I'm having a pointer which will hold the address of another node. So it should be of type struct node type. So this is how I create, uh, I uh, define a node. And then I'm having a pointer which is start, star start. Uh, this is a pointer, start is a pointer of type struct node, which is having null in it because initially it is null in it because there is no elements added into it. And uh, how to create a node? So this is how you create a node by using the malloc function. Uh, so I say PTR is equal to struct node star, and then I say malloc, then size of struct node. So this will take one argument, which is size of uh, uh, struct node, so it is taking this size and malloc gives a void pointer. So the return type of malloc is a void pointer. So you have to typecast it. So this void pointer should be of type struct node star. So that's why we are typecasting this pointer to be this node type. And then um, malloc gives the address, right? So this address is returned to this PTR. That's why PTR is a pointer of struct node type. The malloc gives the address. This is how you create a node in a single linker list. How do you create a loop in a single linker list? So say for example, this is an example where uh, uh, the first node is pointing to the second node and second node uh, to third node and third to four and four to five and five is pointing to two. So you can see that there is a loop here between two, three, four, five and two, there is a loop here. So how do you detect loop uh, in a single linker list? Uh, so by using the hashing approach, we can detect loop in a single linker list. Okay, so how can you do that? Traverse the list one by one and keep putting the node addresses in the hash table. We'll be putting the node addresses in the hash table. If at any point, if null is reached, uh, then return false. And if the next of the current node, uh, 
uh, points to any of the previously stored nodes, then uh, the hash will return true, meaning that there is a loop. If it returns true, it means that there is a loop. If it returns false, it means that there is no loop. What is dynamic memory allocation? Dynamic memory allocation can be defined as a procedure in which the size of a data structure, like array, for example, is changed during the runtime. So C provides some functions to achieve these tasks. And these, uh, there are four uh, library functions provided by C defined under this particular header file. So standard lib.h is a header file to facilitate dynamic memory allocation uh, in C program. So what are they? It's a malloc function, calloc, p, and realloc. So let us uh, differentiate between malloc and calloc. So what is malloc? Malloc allocates only, you can also say that it is malloc, malloc or malloc. So it allocates only single block of requested memory. But whereas uh, calloc or calloc allocates multiple blocks of requested memory. And how, what is the syntax? Okay, so the syntax is like I'm saying, uh, PTR is equal to malloc some 20 into size of int and all that. So how many blocks I want, I'm mentioning over here. Uh, so how many elements are there, I'm mentioning over here. Uh, so 20, 20 into four, uh, the size of integer is four, 20 into four bytes of memory is allocated, okay? In single block, it is allocated in single block. So total of 80 bytes are allocated. Now here in calloc, I'm having two arguments. The first one is 20 and the second one is 20 into uh, size of int, meaning that I want 20 blocks of memory. Okay, I want 20 blocks of memory and each block is of 80 bytes, meaning 20 into four, which is 80 bytes. So I'll be having 20 blocks with the 80 bytes of size. Each block size is 80 bytes. And malloc doesn't initialize, uh, so it keeps the garbage values for the allocated memory. Cannot initialize the allocated memory to zero. And typecasting must be done now, since this function returns void pointer, so you need to typecast. So here in star and up to memory, so this is typecasting. And uh, here for same, uh, for calloc also, you need to typecast because it gives a void pointer. So these are the differences between malloc and uh, Calloc. What is free and realloc? So when you no longer need the dynamically allocated space, we should give it back to the operating system. This can be done by calling the free function. So I said free PTR. So the size of an allocated block of memory can be increased and decreased by using the realloc function. So the realloc function will take two arguments in it. The first argument is the pointer. And the next argument is the size, new size, whatever is the new size. And then it returns, uh, it allocates, increases the size and gives the address back to PTR. So free is to free the memory and realloc is to increase the size of the, um, so increase the size. Difference between void and null. Null is actually a value. So uh, whereas void is a data type identifier. So when you have a function, so the function written type is void, meaning that it is not returning anything. Null is simply uh, used to indicate an empty value. So say, for example, in the previous case, I said the last node in the linked list is pointing to null, is holding null, meaning that it's an empty value, okay? But void is different. Void is used to identify pointers as having no initial value. And a variable that is given a null uh, simply indicates an empty value. And void is a data type identifier. So void is used to indicate that the function method does not return any data type. Null indicates that the pointer variable is not pointing to any address. So this is the difference between void and null. They both are not same. When do memory leak occurs? Memory leak occurs when a program does not free a block of memory allocated dynamically. So we have to use that free method that uh, I have talked about in the previous slide. So if you're not using that free and freeing the memory, send the, then the memory leak can occur. Memory leak occurs when programmers create a memory in heap and forget to delete it. When they forget to delete it, then the memory leak occurs. If too many memory leaks occurs, they can uh, uh, assert all memory and bring everything to halt and or slow the processing considerably. 
what happens is if too many memory leaks occur, then uh, the uh, efficiency will drop. What is a stack? A stack is a linear data structure which uses the principle that is uh, elements in a stack are added or removed only from one end, which is called as a top. The stack is LIFO, which is last in first out uh, data structure, as the last element uh, is the first to come out. So you can see here that I already have one on the stack and I want to put two. So put this put, uh, two is put on top of uh, one. And also coming uh, three is put on top of two. Okay, so this is how we are putting and this is considered to be top over here. Okay, so this is top. So you can see that top is very lean. So top is always pointing to the recently inserted element. So top will be here. And after inserting five, now top will come over here. So it's a variable which will be holding the, uh, uh, I mean, recently inserted element. And uh, the, these are all the push operations. Now pop operation will actually remove the element at the top. So to pop up the recently, the last inserted element will be the first to come out. So you can see that after taking five only, I can take four. And after taking four only, I can take three. And after taking three only, I can take two. Okay, so this is last in first out of principle. And stack follows this principle. Difference between array and stack. A stack can store data of different data types, where array can store similar data types. Size of the stack keeps on changing. Okay, we can change the size of a stack. Uh, as we insert and delete the elements, but the size of array is fixed. So these are the two differences between array and stack. Applications of stack. Stacks are used for reversing a list. They're used for parenthesis checker, and uh, they're used to convert, uh, converting an infix, infix expression into postfix expression, and evaluation of the postfix expression, conversion of an infix expression into postfix expression, and uh, uh, then evaluation of a prefix expression. Uh, so this is conversion of an infix to the prefix expression. Okay, right. And then recursion, they're used in recursion and it is used in backtracking uh, problems and it is also used in function call. So these are all the applications of stack. Operations performed on a stack. The operations are the first one is push operation, pop operation, peak operation, is empty and is full. So what is push? Inserting an element into stack, pop, removing an element from the stack, peak, uh, finding out what is the recently inserted element, that is the element at the top of the stack, is empty checks whether the stack is empty or not, is full checks whether the stack is full or not. And all these operations will take order of one time complexity, constant time complexity. Order of one means that it is constant time complexity. Ways of implementing a stack. There are two different ways of implementing a stack. The first one is using an array. The other one is you can implement it using a linked list. What is overflow condition? When a stack is completely full and we try to insert more elements into the stack, then this condition is called as overflow condition. And uh, you cannot, when the stack is in overflow condition, you cannot further add elements into the stack unless and until an element is deleted. And what is the condition? Uh, overflow condition, this top is equal to max size minus one. So maximum size of the array minus one because the index starts with zero. Uh, so that's the reason why we are saying max size minus one. Top is the index of the newly inserted element. If stack is empty, top will be minus one. And if stack is full, top will be max size minus one. What is a queue? Q is a linear data structure in which the elements that are inserted in the principle of based on the principle of a first in first out. Okay, so the first is the first to be deleted. So first in first out is a principle, the element that enters into the queue first will be the first to be deleted. So how can you implement a queue? You can implement a queue using uh, arrays and a linked list. So this is an example of a, a queue where 55 is the first to enter into the queue. So you can see there, is, there are two pointers, the front pointer and the rear pointer. The front pointer will be pointing to the first element in the queue and the rear pointer will be pointing to the last element in the queue. And this is the front end and this is the rear end. 
and uh, from the front end you can do the dq operation meaning that deletion operation so from the front end you can do the deletion operation from the rear end you will be doing the insert operation so you can do the insert operation the insert is all, always done which is called as an nq operation is always done at the end of the queue okay so say i want to add 90 into the queue so i'll be adding 90 over here okay and i want to delete something what happens is this is deleted and the front will point to 67 now okay so this is how the nq and the dq operations are performed on a queue which are based on the principle first in first out what are the operations performed on the queue we just saw now right so it is an nq operation dq operation and p is empty is full now what is nq operation operation uh, refers to inserting an element at the rear of the queue and delete operation refers to deleting an element from the front of the queue and peak operation returns the element which is in the front of the queue okay and then checks the queue is empty checks the queue is empty or not is full checks whether the queue is full or not what are the applications of the queue Data transfer between input and output buffers is done using queues. CPU scheduling and disk scheduling and uh, managing uh, shared resources between various processes. Job scheduling algorithm, round robin scheduling, recognizing a palindrome, and Josephus problem. So all these uh, algorithms use queue internally. What are the various types of queues? The first type is the basic queue. Then you have circular queue or uh, DEX. Uh, then priority queues and multiple queues. So these are the various types of queues. Uh, so what is a circular queue? Explain the circular queue. So circular queue is a linear data structure in which the operations are performed based on first in first out principle. And the last position is connected back to the first position to make a circle. It is also called as a ring buffer. So you can see that there is no start and end over here. Uh, so this is the front of the queue and this is the rear of the queue. So the insertions happen at the rear of the queue, okay? And uh, the deletions happen from the front of the queue. So if you want to delete this 10, the 10 will be deleted and front will be pointing the, to this node, okay? So whatever front is pointing, it means the it is the first one to enter into the queue. So this uh, space is... Uh, available now for inserting that is circular queue okay so in the basic queue it means that this place is not utilized but in circular queue this place will also be utilized uh, so in case if i'm inserting something say for example i'm inserting 60 what happens is the rear comes to this position and then i'm inserting 70 the rear comes to this position and then i'm inserting 80 the rear comes to this position in the basic queue what happens is it just checks whether the rear is equal to max size minus one. But here in the circular queue, what it does is if front is greater than zero, you actually make, okay, so in case if you want to insert one more element, there is a place here, right? Because front is pointing to this. So what happens is rear comes over here and then another element is inserted, which is 90 over here because there is space. So this concept is called as a circular queue. It is also called as ring buffer. Applications of the circular queue. So applications are like the colors in the traffic uh, signal, right? There are the three colors, right? The red, the green, and the, uh, the yellow, orange, right? So uh, the colors keep changing uh, because they are put in the circular queue. And they are also used in page replacement algorithms. What is DEC? You call this as a DEC, okay? Uh, DEC means that it is double-ended queue. Double-ended queue means that it allows insert and delete at both the ends. You can insert and delete from both the ends. It is also called as head-tail linked list. And the operations that you can perform on the deck are insert front, then also delete front. I said like insertions and deletions can happen at both the ends. Insert last and delete last. So both at both the ends, the insertions and deletions happen. Along with these basic operations, you can also perform operations like get front, uh, get rear, is empty, is full. So get gets the front item from the queue, get front gives the first item, and uh, the last item is obtained by using the get rear. Is empty uh, will actually check whether the get, uh, deck is empty or not. Is full checks whether the deck is full or not. 
So this is another type of Q. What is variance of deck? So there are in the deck, there are two variants. The first variant is input restricted deck, and the second one is output restricted deck. What is input restricted? As I said, like deck is something which we where insertions and deletions can happen at both the ends, right? But here, what we are doing is like we are give, giving a restriction. Uh, so in the input restricted, so you can see that input is restricted. Input can be done at only one end, whereas deletion can happen from both the ends. So such kind of variant of deck is called as input restricted deck. And then output restricted deck. So it is output restricted. Okay, so deletion. So deletion can happen at only one end, and uh, uh, whereas input can be done at uh, both the ends. So these are the two variants of uh, deck. Uh, so the next question is, do you applications of deck? So the applications of deck are, uh, they are used for palindrome checker and uh, decks are also used uh, for job scheduling algorithm. What are priority queues? A priority queue is a data structure in which each element is assigned a priority. The priority of the element is used to determine the order in which the element will be processed. An element with higher order is processed before an element with the lower priority. So the element which is having higher priority will be processed first. And two elements with the same priority are processed on the first come, first, first serve basis. So this is a priority queue. What are the minimum number of queues needed to implement the priority queues? Two queues are needed. One queue is used to store the data elements and the other queue is used to store the priorities. How to implement stack using queue? So a stack can be implemented using two queues. Let me show you how it is possible. Say for example, I'm having the stack like this. So I want to insert elements like 10, 20, 30 and into the 30 into the stack. So what I'll do, first I'll insert 10. So top will be pointing over here. Then I want to insert 20. So 20 will go on top of 10. Now top will be here. And then I am inserting 30. Now top will be here. So the one which is inserted last will be the one to come out first, okay? So last in, first out. So this is the strategy of a stack. Now, how do you implement the same thing, but you have to do the last in, first out strategy. You have to implement by using a queue. But the strategy of the queue is first in, first out. Now you should change the strategy of queue that first in, first out into the last in, first out strategy. So for that, you need two queues. So I'm taking two queues over here. The first one is Q1 and Q2. The Q2 queue, I'm using it as a helper queue. So first I need to insert 10. So I'm inserting 10 into Q1. Next I'll be inserting 20. So 20 I have inserted over here. Now see that 20 should be the one, if I want to perform a DQ operation, 20 should be the one which should come out according to the strategy of uh, uh, LIFO, last in, first out. So the last one is 20. 20 should be the one which, which should come out first. So for that, what we need to do is we need to bring this 20, which is the last inserted element to the front of the queue. To do that, I am, ta I am taking this 10 and I'll be putting in this queue, Q2. So I am dequeuing this 10 put it in Q2. And from Q2, I will DQ it and I'll NQ it into Q1. Now you can see that 20 has come to the front of the queue. So you can delete it. So this is how a stack is implemented using two queues. Now say for example, I want to insert another element. So the other element is 30. Now this should be in the front of the queue. To do that, what I'll do? I will DQ these both things. Okay, so I'll put it over here. So which is 10 and 20. Now what I'll do, I'll bring this 20 and 10 over here. Okay, so uh, 30, which is uh, recently added element, 
last added element will become the front of the queue. So this is how you implement stack using queues. What is searching operation? So one of the uh, operations that you perform on the data structures and one of the very, very important operation is the search operation. And search operation means that you want to find whether a particular element is present in the data structure or not. So if the data is found, then we'll return the position of the data and we'll say that search is successful. Else we need to say that we need to display appropriate message that the element is not found and all that. And we say that search is unsuccessful. So this is how we perform the search operation. What are the various uh, types of search operation? And the algorithms are linear search algorithm, binary search algorithm, and Fibonacci search algorithm. Let us see how linear search works. Say, for example, this is the list I'm having. So I have nine elements over here, and I want to perform a linear search. To perform the linear search, I need to know the target element, meaning that target element means that the element that I want to find in the list. So say, for example, the target element is 25. So I want to search whether 25 is there in the list or not. The search will begin with the first element of the list, which is 12. So I do a comparison of 25 with the 12. So 25 is not equal to 12. So I come to the next element in the list and I compare 25 is equal to five or not. It's not equal. So I go to the next element, 25 is not equal to 10. I go to the next element, 25 is not equal to 15. So I go to the next element, 25 is not equal to 31. So 25 is not equal to 20. And then I go 25 is equal to 25. So what happened over here is 25 is found and I'll be re returning the position where exactly I have found the element. I have found the element at the position six. In the similar way, uh, for example, this is a successful search. For example, you want to search for whether 75 is there in the list or not. So what you do again, you start from, this is why it is called as the sequential search. So I search all the elements like this for equality. And finally, you can find that I reached the end of the list, but I didn't find the element 75. So this is called as unsuccessful search. And the time complexity for the best case is order of one. Say I want to search 12. So 12 is equal to 12. So for the first comparison itself, I found the element. So this is the best case. Average case is where finding out 25, 20, all these are the average cases. So wherein the time complexity is order of n. And for the element 75, searching for the element 75, like the element which is not there in the list, then you say that the time complexity is order of n. Uh, now, what is n over here? n is the number of elements in the list. So the search will happen, for example, to search 75, I am comparing all the nine elements in the list. So that's why the time complexity is order of n. So this is how the linear search works. How oh, binary search worked? So binary search, uh, so it works on sorted or ordered list of items. So this is a very, very important point. So to apply the binary search algorithm on a list, the prerequisite is that the list should be in ordered uh, way. Uh, it can be in ascending or descending order, but it should be in the ordered format. Like in the linear search, the list can be in ordered or in unordered fashion. It works on both because there is no point because it starts comparing each and every element from the first uh, so even if it is ordered or it's not ordered, it is not a matter in the linear search, but generally we apply it on an unordered list. Now coming to the binary search, binary search is applied on a sorted list. And uh, the strategy of the binary search is that you will be finding the middle element of the list by using one formula, I'll tell you. 
and then after finding the middle element you compare the target element with the middle element if the target element is less than the middle element you will search in before a uh, sublist of the middle element if the target element is greater than the middle element you will search in the after sublist of the middle uh, mid element so the time complexity of the binary search is order of log n so wherein you can compare the linear search time complexity is order of n but binary search is better than linear search so let us see, look into how binary search works so here i have certain elements so i have nine elements over here and uh, so the strategy of the binary search is to find out the mid element so the middle element is obtained from the low, lower index the lower index is 0 so this is the lower index and the highest index is 8 so this is 8 over here and the formula is like low plus high by 2 so 0 plus 8 by 2 wherein i got the 4 4 is nothing but the index okay so at index 4 uh, whatever element i have that is the mid mid element so 38 is the mid element so 4 is nothing but the index over here so 38 is a mid so say i want to search 44 whether it is there in the list or not so the first thing i'll do is i'll compare 44 with 38 44 is greater than 38 now what this mid has done is this mid has divided the list into two halves so this is the sublist one so you can say that this is the sublist one and this is the sublist two. So as you can observe that uh, all the elements are in ordered format in ascending order and all the elements before uh, this mid element like sublist one are less than 38. So all the elements here are less than 38 and all the elements in the sublist two are greater than 38. Okay, so now since 44 is greater than 38, I will search only in this particular sublist two. So here I have reduced half of the comparisons. So I don't need to look into the sublist one. So half of the comparisons are reduced over here. So that's why it is efficient than the linear search. Now I have 44. So I have 44, 77, 84, and 90. So this is the new sublist. Now recursively, I will apply the same strategy on this new list. So this is uh, at index 5, 6, 7, and 8. Now calculate the mid by saying 5 plus 8 by 2, so which is 13 by 2. So I'll be getting 6, right? So this particular, uh, this is index 6 and 77 is the mid now, is the new mid now. Okay, so now compare 44 with 77. 44 is less than 77. So what I'll do, I will be looking into this sublist. Okay, so I don't require to look into this sublist. So again, I have reduced some uh, comparisons over here. So now coming over here, so again, I need to recursively apply the same strategy. So now I just have one element in the list. So I'll compare 44 with 44. So 44 is equal to 44. I'll say I found the element and uh, at the position 5. So I'll be returning the position of the element. So this is how the binary search works. So here, uh, one point I would like to highlight is to come to this particular, I said like new, uh, new, uh, sublist is this, right? So 44, 77, 84, and 90. So what we'll do is if uh, uh, the target element is uh, uh, greater than the mid, okay? So say, for example, the mid is lesser than the target element, then what you'll do is you'll set the low to mid plus one, okay? Now, for example, say that your mid is greater than the target element, then you will set the high, okay? So high will be equal to mid minus one. So the, this is the algorithm that you will follow to set the low and the high values. Can we apply binary search on linked list? No, we cannot apply binary search algorithm on the linked list because as you have observed in the previous case, like just observe that we are we are finding out the middle element and you are comparing the middle element with the target element. So meaning that there is random access over here. 
So there is random access and uh, uh, arrays support random access. So that's why uh, binary search works best on the arrays. It doesn't work on the linker list because random access is not possible in the linker list. To go to the middle element, again, you have to do a sequential access only. Okay, so that's why you cannot apply binary search algorithm on the linker list because linker list supports the sequential access. And binary search is usually fast, efficient for arrays. Okay, because I mean, it supports random access. And uh, 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 because accessing the middle index uh, between two given indexes is easy and fast. Okay. What is sorting? Sorting means arranging the elements of an array so that they are placed in some relevant order which may be either ascending or descending order. Uh, why do we need sorting is because to uh, for the search operation, okay? So to find an element easily uh, in a list uh, prior to the search operation, if we put the element, sort the elements and perform the search operation, then uh, you'll find the element, the, the, you can apply the binary search and which is an efficient algorithm, and then you can search the element in a better way. So sorting means arranging the elements. So we'll do sorting prior to search operation. And it can be in ascending or descending order. So sorting represents any order. And the order can be in numerical order, or it can be lexical order, or it can be user-defined order. What are the various types of sorting algorithms? So the sortings are divided into two types. The first one is internal sorting algorithms and external sorting algorithms. These are the two types of sorting algorithms. Now, what is internal sorting? Internal sorting means that the lists are small and they fit entirely in the main memory. And if the input data fits entirely in the main memory, then internal sorting techniques are applied. Okay, so internal sorting techniques are applied because all the data is fitting in the RAM. Now, if the data, input data, do not fit entirely in the main memory, then external sorting techniques are applied. So what are the various internal sorting techniques? Bubble sort, insertion sort, quick heap, radix, selection. All these are examples of internal sorting techniques. Example of external sorting technique is merge sort. Merge sort is applied on a data which is very large, meaning that the entire data will not be fit in the main memory at once. So you have to bring chunks and chunks into the main memory, sort it, and then put it back uh, onto the disk and then do that process because the entire data will not fit in the RAM. What is meant by in-place sorting? In-place sorting means that uh, you don't require extra storage. A sort algorithm in which the sort items occupy the same storage as the original ones. An in-place sorting algorithm sorts the algorithm elements in place. That is, it needs only order of one extra space. Now, let me tell you, like for example, I have taken an array 10 and this array 10 is having 10 elements in it. Like say, for example, 5, 6, 8, uh, 9, 10, 21. Like this, I'm having a uh, 10 elements in an array A. Now, after apply, when you apply the sorting techniques, you don't require, you don't take an extra array, which is B, and then do some sorting techniques, like bring the elements into B and then use it like for uh, uh, temporary, uh, as a temporary storage and all that. So you don't take an extra storage you will be sorting in the same array, like you will be swapping the positions. And uh, finally, after swapping the positions, you will bring the same array in a sorted order. Such kind of uh, uh, sorting is considered to be in-place sorting technique. When you bring some extra storage for the sorting purpose, then you call that as out-of-place sorting algorithm. Okay, so that is in-place sorting and uh, out-place sorting. What is meant by stable sorting? Now, a sorting algorithm is said to be stable if two objects with equal keys appear in the same order in the sorting output as they appear in the input array to be sorted. So you can, I'll give you an example of uh, stable sorting here. So you can see there are two eights over here. 
after applying the sort technique, the relative order of eight and eight did not change. So the eight is uh, the blue color eight is here and the uh, red color eight is here. So the order did not change in the output. So this is the input and this is the output. And in the middle, like you applied some sorting technique. Okay, so some sorting algorithm you have applied. And uh, after uh, applying the sorting algorithm, the relative order of the same uh, keys, okay, so didn't change. They are in the same order. Such kind of sorting techniques are called as table sorting. Now, for example, so I have the same elements, eight and eight over here. But after applying the sorting technique, what happened is uh, the eight, so this is the input and uh, this is the output. Uh, this is in the middle, like we applied some sorting technique and after the sorting technique is applied, you can see that this eight, the relative order has changed. This red eight has come before the eight, uh, uh, blue color eight. So you can see that this blue, the order has changed. Okay, so such kind of sorting techniques are called as unstable sorting techniques. So let us see examples of stable and unstable sorting techniques. Now, uh, so the bubble sort, uh, is an in-place sorting technique and it is also a stable sort, meaning that the relative order of the equal keys will not change. Uh, so selection sort is in place, but it is not stable. Insertion sort is in place, but uh, again, it is stable sort. Quick sort is in place, but it is not stable. Heap sort is in place, not stable. Merge sort is not in place. And also because I said like uh, uh, it works on the large uh, data, right? And uh, so you need some extra storage to perform the sorting technique. And also this, it, it is a stable sort, okay? So these are the various sorting algorithms, whether they are in place or stable, you can understand it with this tabular. With this table. Okay, uh, explain bubble sort. So bubble sort is a sorting technique, which is the simplest sorting technique. And uh, bubble sort, uh, uh, why it got the name bubble is that, because it uh, the largest element, okay, bubbles onto the top. So here I have seven, six, four, and a three. So the strategy is like this, okay? So since there are four elements, I will be requiring three passes, okay? So I'll be needing three passes. Uh, now these two adjacent elements are compared, seven and six are compared. Since seven is greater than six, what we do is we'll swap it. Now seven is compared with four. Since seven is greater than four, we are making a swap. So seven came here and seven and three are compared. Since seven is greater than three, what happened? Seven has come over here. So as I said, what does it mean by bubble? Bubble means that the greatest element, okay? So here the greatest or the largest element has bubbled, okay? So has bubbled onto the top, which means that it has gone to its position. So now seven has gone to its position. It's the largest element in the ascending order list. The largest element will be at the end. So coming to the second pass, what we'll do is we will not consider seven now. So without seven, the rest of the elements like n minus one, we'll be doing the sorting. So again, we'll start from the beginning, six and four, six is greater, make a swap. Now six and three, six is greater, so six has come here. So you can see that the greatest elements have popped out. So now we'll uh, won't consider six and seven, we'll uh, consider the rest of the elements starting from the beginning. Four and three, where four is uh, greater than three, make a swap. Okay, so four has gone here. And uh, so there is only one element, meaning that it is already in sorted order. So this is how the bubble sort works. So I explain the selection sort. So selection sorting is a technique which is inferior to uh, insertion sort. 
but selection sort is used generally used for sorting files with very large objects records uh, objects means records over here very large records and small keys okay so where there are small keys and large records selection sort is applied even though it is inferior to insertion sort it, it has got its own applications now the strategy of the selection sort is that you will be finding the minimum element in the list and you will be bringing to the front of the list okay so among 7542 the minimum element is 2 so what we did we have uh, we brought it to the first position and the first element is swapped with it okay so we are swapping the first location with the element so 7 is going here and 2 is coming over here so now you can see that now we will we won't consider this okay so this is considered to be the sorted list and this is the unsorted list okay sorted list and unsorted list now in in the unsorted list we'll find the minimum element so which is four so four need to be swapped with five and five comes to the fourth position so you can see that two and four are swapped. So now five and seven. Among five and seven, the minimum is five. So five goes here and seven. So since this is the only one element, mean that it is in the sorted order. So this is how uh, the selection sorting works. Now I explain quick sort. Okay, quick sort uh, first selects the value which is called the pivot value. Uh, so what is meant by pivot value? So there are different ways of choosing the pivot value. Pivot value is a value which divides the list into two parts. Yeah, and the pivot element will go into its original position after the uh, pass. After the first pass, what happens is the pivot element will go to its uh, final position. And the choosing of the pivot is a very important strategy over here. It can be the first element or it can be the last element, or it can be uh, the mean or the piddle element. The algorithm of the quick sort is as follows. Select an element uh, P word from the array elements. So from among the elements, like we'll be picking one P word element, rearrange the elements in the array in such a way that all elements that are less than the P word appear before the P word, and all elements greater than pivot, pivot element come after it. Equal values can go either ways. It can, if an element is equal to pivot, it can go into the previous list or the after list. After such a partition, because quicksort is a divide and conquer algorithm. So after such a partition, the pivot is placed in its final position. Okay. And... Uh, now you have got two lists, right? The pivot will be in the middle. So the pivot element will be in the middle. So this is the pivot element and you are getting two sublists. Okay, so all the elements before this are less than pivot and all these are greater than pivot. So now recursively, we'll apply quicksort individually on this list and on this list. So this quicksort is a recursive algorithm. So let us look into how the quicksort works. So in this particular example, so 54 is the P word. Now we are taking two uh, pointers over here. So this is the left mark and this is the right mark. So what you have to do is we will be checking that the left mark will always point to, uh, will, will always point to the lesser than P word element. And it will stop when it finds an element which is greater than P word. And the right mark will point to, will keep on uh, moving uh, till the elements are greater than P word. It will stop when it finds an element which is uh, less than the P word. Okay, right. Uh, so now 26. Okay, so 26 is less than P word. So what happened? We are incrementing the pointer left mark and left mark has come here. So as I told you, left mark will stop when it finds an element which is greater than P word. So it has stopped here. So left mark stopped because 93 is greater than 54. Now this right mark will stop when it finds an element which is less than the P word. So 20 is less than the P word. So right mark also stopped over here. So right, right mark stopped as well as the left mark stopped. Now what we have to do is 
we have to make a swap of these two elements. Okay, so 20 will come here and 93 will go here. So you can see 20 has come here and 93 has gone over here. And now we'll start moving the left mark because left mark have to stop when it finds an element which is greater than the pivot. Now 20 is less than pivot. Uh, so it will move to 17 now. 17 is less than pivot. So what it will do, it will go to the next position, 77. So 77 is greater than uh, pivot. So it will stop. Now the left mark will be here. So you can see that the left mark has stopped. Now coming to the right mark, so 93 is greater than P1. So it will be moving to this position. So 55 is greater than P1. So it has moved to 44. So now this is the right mark. So you can see that right and left mark have stopped. So as they stop, you have to make a swap. Okay, so swap these two elements. Okay, so 44 have come here and 77 have come here. Now again, apply the same strategy. So 31, uh, you can see that 31 is less than uh, 54. So I will be moving left mark onto the right. So left mark has come here and 77 is uh, greater than 54. So left mark stopped. And you can see that right, uh, a right mark uh, 44, right? So 77 have come here. So it will be moving onto the left. Okay, so since it find right mark will stop when it finds less than pivot element. So right mark has stopped here. But you can see that they have crossed over. Right mark and left over, they have crossed over. Okay, so when they cross over, what you have to do is you have to swap the pivot element with the element which is pointing to the, uh, which is pointed by the right marker. So now pivot will come here and this will go there. Okay, so 31 will go there. Now, if you can see that I'm having two lists, the first list is 31, uh, then 26, uh, then I have 20, 17, 44, and then I have 54, then 77, 55, and 93. And P word is here. In the sorted list, Okay, so what is the final sorted list? The final sorted list is 17, 20, 26, 31, 44, 54, 55, 77, and 93, right? So this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So what is the position of 54? The position of 54 is at index 5. Now take this index, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So 54 is in fifth position. So you can see that the pivot after each and every iteration goes to its final position. One element will be in its final position, will be in sorted order. So 54 has gone to its original position that it, it, is, it will be there in the final output. Now I have two lists. This is the sublist one and this is the sublist two. This is the partition. The pivot is partitioning it. All the elements, if you observe before the pivot, are less than the pivot. And all the elements after the pivot are greater than pivot. So there are two sublists. Now what I'll do? Taking each and every sublist. Now I have 70. Now I have 31. Uh, so we have 31, 26, 20, 70, and 44, right? Apply the same strategy. Take the first element as pivot. Now take this as the left marker and take this as the right marker and apply this recursively on this list. And as well as I'll be applying the same recursive algorithm on the next list. So I'll take 55 as pivot. This will be the left marker and this will be the right marker and sort them. Okay, so this is divide and conquer. After sorting each and everything, we'll be conquering them. So this is how the quick sort works. Uh, so explain the insertion sort. So insertion sort is a sorting algorithm which works on the basis of cards, right? So we say uh, how we play the playing cards. So it works in that particular strategy. It is a simple sorting algorithm uh, in which the sorted array is built uh, one element at a time. So you'll be building it one 
element at a time. So it is a familiar uh, sorting technique uh, as we usually use it for ordering a deck of cards uh, while playing a bridge game. Uh, so what we'll do here is it is also called as online sorting uh, algorithm because we are not bothered about what are the elements at the end. We start with the beginning of the uh, list. Okay, so at the first we'll take four itself and we'll say we'll divide it into two halves and we say this is the sorted list and we'll say that all the entire list after this is the unsorted list. Next, what we'll do is now we'll uh, increment this one. Okay, so we'll bring it here, we'll divide it. And now compare these two elements, four and three, and sort it. Okay, so four, three comes here and four comes here. Now, what I'll do is I'll take the next element and then sort it. Then it becomes two, three, and four. Next, next I take 10. What I'll do, I'll sort it two, three, four, and 10. Okay, next I'll take 12 and then I'll sort it. Next, I'll take one and then I have sorted it. it, it has come. So you can see that how many other elements I add after it also, it will sort it. Okay, so this is how the insertion sort works. So there will be two partitions here, the sorted and the unsorted list, and we'll try to build one element at a time. We'll add one element at a time to the sorted list and sort the list. What are the time complexities of the sorting algorithms? So you can see that first we'll see the linear search, uh, order of one, n and n, and the space is order of one. Binary search is its order of one, best case, and wherein the middle element is the, the target element. So one comparison, you get the element. So it is order of one, uh, log n, log n, average and the worst, and then the space is order of one. And bubble sort, uh, best time complexity is order of n, and average is n square. Uh, worst case is also n square, okay, order of n square. And this is order of one space. And selection sort is order of n square, and n square, and order of n square. And the space co uh, worst uh, space complexity is order of one. Insertion sort is order of n linear. And uh, this is n square, which is quadratic. Uh, and this is n square quadratic time complexity and order of one space. And merge sort, uh, in all the three cases, you can see it is order of n log n, linear logarithmic time complexity. And the space complexity is order of n. For the quick sort, the best and average is order of n log n. But take a very uh, uh, good look at this particular uh, worst case time complexity. The worst case time complexity of quick sort is order of n square. OK, so that's one of the drawbacks of the quick sort. And uh, uh, so the worst case, uh, uh, the worst space complexity is order of log n. So the heap sort is stable. You can see that in all the cases, it is n log n. Uh, and the uh, space is order of n. And uh, the bucket sort it is n plus k. k represents the digits in the number. n represents the number of elements. k represents the number of digits in the number. And uh, the worst is order of n square. And uh, the space is order of n. OK, so this is again the radix sort, order of n, k, n, k, and n, k. And n plus k is the space complexity. And this is for the Tim sort. Uh, order of n, n log n, n, n log n, and the uh, space is order of n. The shell sort, it is order of n, and uh, this is n log n part two shell sort, and this is uh, uh, for the average and worst case, the time complexity is same, and then the space is constant for the shell sort. So these are the various uh, best average worst time complexities of various searches and uh, sorting techniques. Advantages of uh, insertion sort. Uh, so the insertion sort is easy to implement and uh, efficient to use on small data sets of data. And uh, it can be efficiently implemented on data sets uh, that are substantially sorted, okay? And uh, it performs better than algorithms like uh, selection and bubble sort. And it is simpler than shell sort. And it is twice as fast than the bubble sort and 40% faster than selection sort. It requires less memory space and it is said to be online. Okay, online sort. What are the pros and cons of quick sort? 
uh, the pros are like it is faster than bubble selection and insert and uh, it can sort small medium and large data sets like you can see insertion selection bubble all those are for the smaller data sets but uh, uh, quicksort suits even the large data set and uh, these are the advantages and coming to the limitations it is complex and it is massively recursive and the worst case time complexity is order of n square advantages of external sorting external sorting is used to update a master file from a transaction file uh, for example updating the employee file based on the new hires or any modifications you want to do into the employee file you can do it using external sorting technique it is also used in database applications for, for, uh, uh, for performing operations like projection and join and projection means that uh, you want to uh, show certain uh, subset of fields and a join means that joining two files on a common field uh, to create a new file whose fields are union of uh, the two files which are used for join and external sorting is used to remove duplicate records in a file so these are all the advantages of external sorting what are recursive algorithms? The process in which the function calls itself directly or indirectly is called as recursion. Um, a function calling itself or it's a loop, uh, a function call in a loop is also called as a recurs recursion. And the corresponding function is called as a recursive function. Okay, so the function which is calling itself, it's called as a recursive function. And using recursive algorithms, uh, certain problems can be solved quite easily. And uh, the various recursive algorithms are traversal finai. And uh, the in order pre order and post order tree traversals, you will do it very easily using recursion. And uh, depth first traversal of a graph, you will be using, uh, wherein you will be using recursion. Various approaches of algorithms. What are the various approaches of an algorithm? So I discussed the three approaches over here, divide and conquer and dynamic programming and greedy approach. So what is divide and conquer? So divide and conquer involves dividing the entire problem into sub problems and then solving each of them independently. So that is called as divide and conquer. I'll give you an examples. I'll give you ex uh, examples for these algorithms in my next slide. Uh, identical to divide and conquer approach uh, with the, uh, the exception that all the sub problems are solved together. So that is dynamic programming. Gre greedy approach means that finds the solution by choosing the next best option. So these are the various uh, algorithm designing design techniques. Uh, what are the various algorithms which are greedy algorithms that we know? So the first one is Dijkstra's uh, uh, minimum spanning tree. Next, uh, graph map coloring, graph vertex cover, then job scheduling problem, knapsack problem, uh, Kruskal's uh, minimum spanning tree, Prim's minimum spanning tree, traveling salesman problem. All these are examples of trading algorithms. <laughs> Examples of divide and conquer algorithms. Uh, so the first is the binary search algorithm. Uh, next is merge sort, quick sort, uh, Strassen's uh, matrix multiplication. So all these are examples of divide and conquer. Examples of dynamic programming algorithms. Uh, so generating the Fibonacci series, Towers of Hanoi, uh, all page shortest path algorithm, which is Floyd's partials. Uh, so all these are examples of dynamic programming algorithms. So what is a binary tree? A binary tree is a data structure that is defined as a collection of elements called nodes. Okay, so trees are the concept which are non-linear data structures. So it is a non-linear data structure uh, wherein the relative order or the adjacency of the elements is not maintained. So here it's in hierarchical. You can see that there are multi levels over here. Uh, so the root is in uh, the level zero and then the next level and all that. So there are multi levels here, unlike like your linear data structures where there are no levels. So here you can see that there are multi levels and uh, uh, and uh, you can see that. Uh, so I have root over here. So one node which is on the top of the tree is called as the root node. Um, and why we call this as a binary tree is because it will have at most two children. So binary tree will have at most two children. Okay, so what does it mean by at most two children? It means that a node can have zero or one or two children. 
okay an node can have zero or one or two children uh, so uh, not more than that uh, not uh, more than two okay so it will be having only two branching over here two links over here so that's why binary means that two links okay so binary means that two links uh, two pointers pointing to one pointer pointing to the left subtree and the other pointer pointing to the right subtree so that's a concept of binary binary means two right okay so here this is the root root is at level zero and uh, so this is level one, seven and 15 are in level one, uh, five, nine, 13, 20, all these are in level two and level three, all these are there. And this is called as a subtree, okay? So this also is called as a subtree. This also is called as a subtree, okay? So this also is called as a subtree. And uh, uh, this side, okay? So this is called as the left subtree and this is called as the right subtree. And all these are the internal nodes, okay? 7, 15, 13, 20, 5, 9, all these are the internal nodes. Uh, 3, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 18, 25, all these are the leaf nodes. And uh, so you can see that 12 and 14, okay, uh, which are in the same level from the same parent, they're called as siblings. Okay, 13 and 20, they are siblings. Okay, so this is the terminology of a uh, tree. What is a binary search tree? Okay, so binary search tree is a binary tree. But there is a condition over here where each node contains a value from a well-ordered set. For each node n in the binary search tree, the following uh, uh, invariants hold. Every node in the left subtree of n contains a value which is smaller than the value in the node n. Every node in the right subtree which is larger than the value in the node n. So, uh, so let me show you this example. So this is also a binary search tree. So you can see that 7, 5, 9, 3, 6, 8, 10, all these are lesser than 11. Okay, so all the elements in the left subtree, all the elements in the left subtree are lesser than 11. And all the elements in the right subtree are greater than or equal to 11. So this equal to can go in uh, on the left in the left subtree or the right subtree. It is your choice. Uh, so all the elements greater than this 11, uh, uh, greater than or equal to this 11 goes into the right subtree. So searching becomes very easy over here in the binary search tree. That's why when the binary tree, when the binary tree uh, with the search property, okay, so with the search property, uh, becomes the binary search tree. So binary search tree is a binary tree with the search property. What is the search property? That the root, okay? So the left subtree and the right subtree, right? Uh, right subtree, right? So all the elements in the left subtree should be less than the root and all the elements in the right subtree should be greater than or equal to the root. So that is what is called as the search property. So such kind of trees are called as binary search tree. Traversing a binary tree. There are three ways of traversing a binary tree. The first one is pre-order, in-order, and post-order. How do you find out whether a binary tree is a binary search tree or not? So this is a question. Okay, how do you find out? Given that you have a binary tree, how do you find out whether this binary tree is a binary search tree or not? So just to find out the in-order. So if the in-order gives a sorted list, then it is called as a binary search tree. If the traverse the binary tree, if the in order traverser of the binary tree gives you a sorted list, then it is called as a binary search tree. What is pre order traversal? Pre order traversal means that pre means before. So, first I will traverse the root, then I'll go to the left node, and then I'll go to the right node. So, that is called as uh, pre order traversal. Pre order traversal. Traversal means that visiting the nodes. The order in which I visit the nodes is visit the root, traverse the left, left subtree, and then traverse the right subtree, and individually apply it on every node recursively. Then, in order. In the in order, so I'll have the left subtree. I'll traverse the left subtree, then the root, and then the right. Okay, so it gives the sorted order. For example, 
uh, I have five over here and three here and seven here. When I do the uh, in order traversal, so I go to the left subtree, right? So three is visited and then five is visited and seven. So you can see that I'm getting a sorted list. So when a sorted list is obtained, it means that it is a binary search tree. Okay, so this is a binary tree, uh, but is this binary tree a binary search tree or not? So for that, we are applying this uh, thing. And next is post order traversal. In the post order traversal, left the subtree is traversed, then right subtree, and then you will be traversing the root. Okay, so this is called as post traversal, uh, post order traversal. So these are the three traversals that you will be applying on the binary tree. Okay, so let me give you an example. Uh, so here, uh, uh, the this is a binary tree and the pre-order. Okay, so pre-order is where you are traversing the route. So first A is taken. Then after going here, this has become like a subtree, right? So this is again a subtree. Apply the same strategy over here. So B is the root. So put to B. Then left, okay, which is D. And then what you did? So you have traversed the root, then the left subtree, now come on to the right subtree. Then this independently will become a tree for you. So uh, here, this is the root in this particular uh, subtree. So uh, C is printed, then go on to the left side. This again will become independently a tree. So E and G will become an independently a tree. So recursively apply this strategy wherein E is the root. So E comes here and G uh, is, uh, uh, the right uh, subtree because there is no left left tree you're coming on to the right and then again uh, left uh, uh, root uh, and then the left now coming to the right so again f is the root so h is the left tree and i is the right subtree so this is the pre-order traversal of this particular example okay and uh, now let us look into the post-order traversal so coming to the post-order traversal Okay, so what is post order? Post order means that left, right, and root, right? So this is left, B, D has come, then there is no right, so root. Okay, so left, right, root. So this is over. Now this is considered to be left. So you go on to the right. This is root, right? And this is right. Okay, go on to the right side. Now after going on to the right side, so this has become the root and this is the left and this is the right. So now go on to the left side. So after going on to the left side, so this independently, now again, this has become the root. Uh, left is not there, so this is the right. So what I'll do, G and E is printed. Left, root, uh, left, right, and root. So this is over. So the left side is over. Now come on to the right side. Okay, so come on to the right side. So wherein we are saying, uh, so H, I, and F, H, I, and F. So this is left, right, now print the root, which is C. So this left is over, this right is over, and now you have to print the root, which is A. <clears throat> this is the post-order traversal. Now let us look into the in-order traversal. Okay, so the in-order traversal is left root and right, right? So this is left root, okay? So this is over. So this entirely becomes the left, so root, okay? So print the root and come on to the right. After coming on to the right, again, this has become a subtree. So this is the root. So this is your left, come over to the left. Okay, so after coming, this has become your root. Okay, so E and G, so this is over. Now come on to the 
root so print the root come on to this side so again this has become your root left and right recursively you have to process it so h f and i so this is your in order traversal now what is level order traversal is also called as a breadth okay so breadth order traversal so what is breadth order traversal it is level order so how do you do that uh, Okay, so level order is like this. Okay. Right. Okay, so A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, H, I. So this is your level order, which is also called as breadth order traversal. So what's the height of a node in a tree? What is the height? Okay, so the total number of edges that lies on the longest path from any leaf node to a particular node is called as the height of the node. So height of the tree is the height of the root node. So you can see that all the leaf nodes are at the height is zero. Now what is, so the height of H is zero, K is zero, so the height is zero and this is zero, zero. This is also zero, this is also zero. Now what is the height of G? The height of G is one, meaning that there is one path, right? One line over here, one connection. So it is one. So what is the height of C? The height of C is this side, there are two lines and uh, this side there is one. So the maximum you take, okay? So the height of uh, C is two. And now what is the height of B? The height of B is, so there is one over here. So there is one over here and there is two over here and two over here. So the maximum is two. So the height of B is two. Height of E is one, okay, one, one. So maximum is one, so one. What is height of A? The height of A is one, two, three. One, two, and three. The height of A is three, okay? So this is how you find out the height of a node in the tree. This is important uh, when you want to uh, create a balanced uh, trees. Applications of the trees. Okay, so the trees are used in file system directories. Uh, then they are also used to create arithmetic uh, trees, arithmetic expression handling. They are used in 3D video game to determine what object needs to be rendered and uh, uh, used in almost every high bandwidth routers uh, for storing uh, the router table and used in compression algorithms such as those used by the .jpg. Uh, JPEG and MP3 files formats and hierarchical data modeling and BTs are used to store uh, tree structures on the disks. So, so these are all the applications of uh, the tree. What are balancing trees? Uh, so balancing binary tree also refers to a height balancing uh, binary tree is defined as a binary tree in which height of the left subtree and height of the right subtree uh, of any node differs by not more than one. Let, let me explain you what is height balancing uh, tree. So if, for example, I'm having a binary tree like this, uh, so I'm saying 10, uh, 9, 8, and 7. So I can have a binary uh, search tree like this. Okay, so this is a binary search tree. Um, and this can be... Uh, 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 this is a binary tree, which is a uh, not balanced tree, but you can see that uh, it is skewed onto uh, the left. Okay, so it is considered to be a left skewed binary search tree where it is uh, inclined onto the left side. Okay, so here the point is the deep the tree is. Okay, so the tree is deep, so the search time also increases. Search time will increase. Okay. So it is needed that you balance these binary search trees. Binary search trees need a balancing factor. Uh, so what is this balancing factor? The balancing factor means that height of uh, left subtree minus height of right subtree. Okay, so height of left subtree minus height of, okay, height of uh, right subtree. Uh, it should not be more than one, okay? So it should be one or minus one or zero or one, okay? It should be only within this, okay? So the value should be minus one, zero or one. Uh, so if it is uh, going beyond this, uh, if it is more than this, what we'll do is we'll apply certain rotation strategies and uh, we'll apply some rotations and bring it to the balancing state. 
Okay, so balance means that. So binary circuit tree plus balancing factor results in a height balanced binary trees. And examples of those are AVL trees, red black trees, clay trees. All these are height balanced binary circuit trees. Okay. Uh, what are multi-way circuit trees? A multi-way tree is a tree that can have more than two children. So binary means that it is having two links, two pointers, pointing to the one pointing to the left subtree and the other pointing to the right subtree. But here you can have more links. Such type of trees are called as multi-way trees. Multi-way tree of order M is one uh, in which a tree can have M children. Okay, and uh, uh, each node has M children and M minus one case. For example, uh, so I'm having a, Okay, uh, say that I'm having uh, uh, three elements over here. So this is K1, K2, and K3. Okay, and this is the link. Uh, so I'm having four links. So since it is having four links, meaning that M children, okay, meaning that four children. Okay, four children are there. So this tree is called as order four, a binary, a tree with order four, and uh, which will be having three elements inside it. Okay, so M minus one keys. So I have order four. So wherein I'll be having three key fields over here. So this this uh, is called. So this is called as a multi-way tree, and uh, the keys in each node are in ascending order. Uh, so here the keys will be like, for example, thirty-four or seventy-five and one not five like that. So the keys should be in uh, ascending order. And uh, this link, right? So there are four links like this. Uh, so all this link will lead to the elements which are less than 34. And this link will lead to elements which are greater than or equal to 34 and less than 75. And this link will lead to uh, greater than or equal to 75 and less than 105. And this link will lead to elements which are greater than or equal to 105. Uh, so that's how. Uh, this point is mentioned. So these are multi-way search trees. <laughs> Examples of the multi-way search trees are B trees and B plus trees. Uh, so B tree is a specialized M-way tree that can be widely used for disk access. Okay, and uh, uh, in the B tree, search keys and data stored in internal or the leaf nodes. They are stored in both. Okay, either internal nodes or in the leaf nodes. Uh, search Search is not that easy compared to the B plus trees, and no redundant search keys are present, and deletion is difficult in B trees. So, B plus tree is an advanced version of B trees, and it is also an MRA tree, and it is a balanced tree. Okay, so uh, all the uh, leaves are in the same level uh, with a variable, uh, but often large number of children per node. And a B plus tree consists of the root, internal nodes, and the leaves, and the data is stored only in the leaf nodes. So here the data is stored in the internal as well as the leaf nodes, but here in B trees. But in B plus trees, it is stored only in the leaf nodes. In the leaf, and the leaf nodes are all uh, linked using the link of this. And deletion is easy in the B plus trees. So these two are examples of multi-way search trees. What is a graph? Graphs are data structures that can be used in computer science in a variety of contexts for implementing the mathematical concepts. And graphs are widely used to, to model any situation where entities are, uh, or things are related to each other in pairs. What's the definition of a graph? A graph G is defined as an ordered set like B, capital B and capital E. V represent vertices, number of vertices, all the set of vertices, and D represents the set of edges, where uh, B of G represents set of vertices and E of G represents the edges that connect these vertices. What are different ways of a graph representation? So the first one is, uh, adjacency matrix and the second one is adjacency list and the third one is the adjacency multi-list. So these three are the ways in which you can represent a graph. So let us look into what is adjacency matrix. So you are having a directed graph over here. Uh, so these blue color things over here are the uh, vertices. So the vertices are named as zero, one, two, three, and four. So I'm having, so this is a matrix is nothing but a two-dimensional array. Uh, 
so I'm having rows and columns. Uh, so here they represent the uh, vertices, the blue color numbers are nothing but the vertices. And each and every intersection of this row and column, so this particular uh, place uh, will be representing the edge. Okay, so it represents the edge. From zero to zero, there is no edge. So if there is no edge, we'll, we'll put a zero. If there is an edge, we'll put a one. This is because it's an unweighted graph. Okay, so this is because we, it's an unweighted graph. If it is a weighted graph, so you'll be having some weights over here, right? So from zero to uh, uh, two, there is a direction and the weight is five. So we'll be putting five over here if it is a weighted graph. So for the unweighted graph, we'll be putting zero and one. So there is no, from zero to zero, there is no edge. So I'm putting a zero. So zero to one, there is an edge. So I'm putting one over here. And zero to two, there is again an edge. So I'm putting one over here. Zero to three, there is no edge. Okay, so that's why we are putting a zero and zero to four, there is no edge, so there is a zero. So this is how the matrix is uh, filled. And uh, uh, this is uh, one of the graph representations. And the next one is adjacency list representation of a graph. So wherein you can see that it's a link over here. So this is an uh, undirected graph. Uh, so this uh, head, okay, an array of pointers, represents all the vertices. So how many vertices are there? Zero, one, two, three, and four. So these are the vertices. And here I'll be maintaining, this is a node, linked list. So this is again a node. So all the edges I'll be connecting. So from zero, I have an edge to one. So I'm putting one. And from zero, I have an edge to two, I put a two and zero to three, I have an edge. From four also, I have an edge. From one to zero, I have an edge. And one to three also, I have an edge and one, two, four, I don't have. So what are all the edges that are present? I'll be maintaining it in the format of a linked list. Okay, so this is uh, another representation, which is adjacency list representation of a graph. Uh, next one is, uh, uh, this is uh, your adjacency multi-list, which is an extension of a linked representation. Uh, so here I'm having, uh, uh, four vertices and all the edges are numbered here, the list of edges, okay? So the first one is uh, zero and one. So this edge is put here and some number we are giving, it can be N zero or E zero or anything you can give. So here I gave N zero and zero to two, this is N one and zero to three, this is N two. So all these three are represented. Now coming to one, okay, start with one. Uh, so uh, zero to one is already represented. So don't put it, okay? Now put the other one. So one to two is not there. So put one to two and name it something and one to three and name it something and two to three and name it, okay? So these are all the list of edges and numbers. And now coming over here. So this is zero and one, the first edge, take the first edge and see, uh, where zero is repeating, okay? So zero is repeating with N1, okay? So it is also repeating in N2, but the next one, okay? So the recent one, uh, which is very near to N0 is N1. So zero is here. So I'm putting N1 here. And next is one, see where one is, okay? So one is here, so which is N3. So I'm putting N3 over here. Okay, now coming to this line. Okay, so zero, where is zero? You have to look only in the down of the vertex list. So it is here. So I have put N2 here and then two, where is two? Two is here. There are two twos over here, but this is near, right? So N3, so I'm putting N3 over here. So now coming to here, zero. So you can see that there is no zeros over here in the bottom. So that's why there is a nil here. And three, there is a three here, which is N4. And one, one is here, which is N4. And two, there is no, uh, there is two, N5. So put here. Now coming to one, there is no one. So put nil, three, there is three, okay, which is N5. Now two, which will be nil and nil. So this is how you will be maintaining an adjacency multi-list. What are graph traversal algorithms? Uh, traversal means method of examining the nodes 
and edges of the graph. So that is what is called as traversal. And there are two methods, standard methods. The first one is breadth first search, which is which will be using a queue, and uh, uh, which is an auxiliary data structure to store nodes for further processing. And depth first search, which will be using a stack, and uh, this uh, stack is used for uh, storing the nodes for further processing. And BFS is, uh, is better at finding the shortest path in a graph, while DFS is bet better at answering the connectivity queries. Okay, so which one to choose based on uh, uh, the situation, the graph that is uh, given to you, you'll be choosing. For example, if the graph is dense, uh, then choose DFS. If the graph is sparse, then choose BFS. Okay, so based on uh, the graph, you'll be making a choice whether to go with the depth first search or breadth first search. So explain the depth first search. So here I have taken a graph. Let me explain you. So DFS uses a stack, right? DFS uses a stack. So before that, the first thing that you need to do is you need to construct an adjacency list. Okay, so I'm I'm creating an adjacency list. So for A, B, C, D, E, and F. Now construct the adjacency list. So from A, I can go to B, C, and D. From B, uh, A is already mentioned in the previous case, so I am not mentioning. I can go to I can go to E and I can go to F. Uh, and then from C, I can go to F. Okay, D, E, and F, all these are previously mentioned. So this is my adjacency list. Okay, so this is my adjacency list. And uh, now let us start working, okay? Find out the traversal. So I am putting a stack, okay? So the starting vertex is A. So insert A into the list. Uh, so A is in, in the list. Now bring A out of the stack. After bringing A out of the stack, now look into the adjacency list and take B and put it in the stack. Okay, so the next node visited is from A, we are going to b so depth first right so we are going to b now take b out and put it in the traverse list okay so it is traverse so you visited right so this is visited uh, over so you have visited so a b is here now after taking b out now put the now put okay, you 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 are now in the b adjacency list right so take the first one which is e Okay, put E onto the stack. So now from B, I have gone to E. Now take out E. After taking out E, go to E in the adjacency list. In E, you don't have anything. Okay, so in E, you don't have anything to process or put it in the stack. So what I will do is I'll backtrack. Okay, go to B again. After go, going to B, now E is already processed. Now take F. Now put F onto the stack. Okay, put F onto the stack. So now take F out. So you have come back and now you're going to F. So go to F. So after going into the F in the adjacency list, there is nothing over here. So what you do, you go back to the parent, which is B. So B is a, all the vertices here is are over. So there is no path from B to the other vertices. Now what you'll do from where you called B, you called B from A, right? Now go back to A and take C and put it in the stack. So C is in the stack. So now you have gone from F, you have gone to B and from B, you have gone to A. Now from A, you're going to C. Okay, you're not going from F to C. Remember, you're going back to A and from A, you have gone to C. And bring C out. Okay, I have got C out and look into what is there in C. So I have F, which is already processed. So F is already processed. So there is no point in bringing F here because it's already visited. So you don't require to visit it again. Uh, so you go back to A again. Okay, and from A, I'm going to B. Okay, so this is how the uh, traversal happened. So from A, you're going to B, and from B, you have gone to E, and from uh, B, you have gone to 
from B you have gone to F and from A you have gone to C and from A only you have gone to D. So this is the spanning tree and this is how uh, the output of the depth the first search. Okay, so the order of the visited nodes is A, B, E, F, C and D. Okay, so DFS uses a stack uh, for uh, uh, processing the nodes. Explain the breadth first search. Okay, so I'm taking the same adjacency uh, list, but here now to perform the breadth first search, we'll be using a queue. So what I'll do, I'll take A, okay? So after taking A out, so A is already visited. So it is breadth first. So what you will do is, you will push all the nodes from uh, uh, that are there in the adjacency list of A. You can see B, C, D are there in the adjacency list. So put all of them, okay? Right. Now take B out. So B is visited. So you have gone from A to B and B is visited. Uh, now take all the elements in B and put it. What are there? E and F are there, right? So you put E and F in the queue. Okay, so now go to C. So A is visiting C now and look into what is there in C. C, there is F, but F is already there in the queue. So you don't require to put the, uh, enqueue it again into the queue. Now again, A is going to D. Okay, so see that it is breadth first. So from A, you're going to B, then C, and then D. Okay, after that, what you're doing, you're taking E out. So you're taking E out. Okay, so you have gone to B. From B, you're going to E, and also from B, you're going to F. Okay, right. Uh, so this is how the traversal takes place. So from A, you're going to B, uh, C, and D, and then E and F. Okay, so this is a spanning tree uh, that is obtained from the breadth first search. And the order is A, B, C, D, E, F. So this is the order of the nodes visited. And we are using Q over here in the best breadth first search. So the applications of the breadth first search so the applications are finding the connected components in the graph tree, find all nodes within an individual connected components, finding shortest path between two nodes in a weighted graph and also in an unweighted graph. And the time complexity to perform breadth first searches order of E plus V. Applications of the depth first search. Okay, so finding whether the graph is connected or not and finding shortest path between two nodes for the weighted and the unweighted graphs and computing the spanning tree of a connected graph. And it is also used for solving puzzles and games. Okay, so backtracking in the games and all that, we'll be using depth first search. And the time complexity is order of E plus V. What are the various the shortest path algorithms? The various the shortest path algorithms are minimum spanning tree, which is also called as MST. And, uh, Dijkstra's algorithm and Warshall's algorithm. So what is minimum spanning tree? Minimum spanning tree uses adjacency list and Dijkstra's and uh, Warshall's use adjacency, uh, Dijkstra's use adjacency list and Warshall's use adjacency matrix. What is the spanning, the minimum spanning tree? There will be only one minimum spanning tree, but there can be many spanning trees for a particular graph. Um, uh, so what is a minimum spanning tree? Okay, so minimum spanning tree is a spanning tree uh, with weight less than or equal to the weight of every other spanning tree. So there can be many spanning trees that you can construct from a graph. Uh, say, for example, this is a graph. Uh, spanning tree means that the connections between all the vertices um, uh, wherein it doesn't form a cycle. It is like a tree, okay? So where there won't be any cycles. Uh, so this is a spanning tree uh, where we are connecting them all the vertices will be there, okay? So there are five vertices, all the five vertices will be there in the spanning tree. But the cost over here is 13. Uh, so likewise, you can have 15 or 20 or 21, all uh, the costs of all the spanning trees are considered. The tree which is having the minimum cost is considered to be the minimum spanning tree and there will be only one spanning tree, okay? So the total weight that is sum of weights of all edges is minimum. 
So spanning trees will not have cycles. So this is the min minimum spanning tree. Algorithms to generate minimum spanning tree algorithms are there. The first one is Prims and the second one is Crystal's algorithm. So Prims algorithm forms spanning tree for connected weighted undirected graph. And Crystal's algorithm forms spanning tree for connected weighted graph. Applications of minimal spanning tree. So MSTs are widely used for designing networks and they're used for finding airline routes. Um, MSTs are used to find the cheapest way to connect the terminals. MSTs are applied in routing algorithms for finding the most efficient path. Applications of graphs. Uh, graphs are used GPS navigation system. Uh, also use the shortest path uh, APIs. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, and all social media networking sites uh, they find they consider each and every user to be node and they'll find out like the friend of friend you get the friend request right how do you get the friend request uh, so the uh, suggestions friend suggestions you get uh, so they'll find out like friends friend can be your friend so that suggestion you get uh, so here uh, they form this uh, graph and they find the friends of friends and all that in circuit networks in uh, transport networks uh, graphs are used and uh, program flow analysis and state transition diagrams and activity network diagrams uh, for all these graphs are used. What is the algorithm to find shortest path tree? Dijkstra's algorithm is used to find shortest path tree. It is widely used in network routing protocols, most notably ISIS and open shortest path first. What is ISIS protocol is an interior gateway protocol. Dijkstra's algorithm do not work for negative edges and the time complexity of Dijkstra's algorithm is order of E log V. What is algorithm to find all pairs shortest path? Uh, so Dijkstra's algorithm is used to find a single source shortest path algorithm. It's called a single source shortest path. Now, for example, you want to find out all pairs shortest path. So the algorithm is plots and Floyd's and Warshall's algorithm it is all pairs shortest path algorithm, meaning it computes the shortest path between all pairs of nodes. The time complexity is order of V cube. Floyd washers work for negative edges, but it do not work for negative cycles. What is a heap data structure? A heap is a special case of binary tree where the parent nodes are compared to the children with their values and are arranged accordingly. Heaps are complete binary trees. Okay, so heaps are complete binary trees and they're implemented using arrays. What is meant by a complete binary tree? Complete binary tree means that all the levels are full with the maximum number of nodes. Okay, so say for example, there are two levels like this, this is zero, one, and two. Uh, so this is the last level, but there is, can be an exception with the last level. Okay, so in the last level, the nodes can be from left to right full. Okay, like this it can be. Okay, so this is a complete binary tree. Even if there is no one node over here, it is okay. Such kind of trees are called as complete binary tree. Uh, another example can be like, uh, so this is also a complete binary tree where there is one more level uh, wherein there is the node at uh, the leftmost end. But if you're having a node like this, then it is not a complete binary tree. The nodes should be full from left to right. Okay, so now it is okay. But if these nodes are not there and I have a node here, then it is not a complete binary tree. Uh, so binary uh, heaps are these. Uh, so this is, there are two types of heaps, the max heap and the min heap. Uh, now, if you consider this max uh, min heap, so this is considered to be a subtree and subtree, and this entire thing is a tree over here. So any subtree you consider, min means that the minimum element among these three. Okay, so these three, right? The minimum element among these three should be at the root. So the minimum is 30, 30 is in the root. So minimum among 40, 15, and 15, 15 is minimum, it's in the root. So the minimum among this left subtree and right subtree is 10, 10 is at the root. So the, such kind of trees are called as min heaps. And uh, coming to the max heap, the maximum element will be at the root. So here the max is 40, so it's in the root. So here the max element is in the root. So here the max element is in the root. So then you call that as the max heap. Applications of heap data structure. Uh, heap data structure is used to uh, sort, okay? 
in sorting, which is called as heap sort algorithm, wherein uh, with, uh, which is an algorithm for sorting elements in either min heap or max heap. Okay, so min heap means that the less element is in the root, max heap means that the greatest element is in the root. So after uh, getting the maximum element among the element, you put it in the last of the list and again find out next max and put it in the last but one position. Likewise, you'll sort the list. Heaps are used to implement priority queues where priority is based on the order of the heap created. Then system concerned with security and embedded systems so such as the Linux kernel use heap sort uh, because of its time complexity. What is a hash table? Hash table is a data structure in which keys are mapped to array positions by using a hash function. We map the keys to array locations or array indices. Uh, value stored in the hash table can be searched in less time. So this is constant time by using a hash function, which generates the address from the key. Let us see how. Uh, so say, for example, this is the key. Okay, so John Smith is the key. Uh, so there is a hash function. I'm giving this John Smith into this hash function. And this hash function is generating me a key uh, index, which is 873. Okay, so that's why I am saying I'm going to this 873 and this 873 will be having the record. Okay, so wherein John Smith is the key. Maybe this is the primary key. You can say that the name of the employee is the primary key. So then uh, this is the record, entire record of the employee, which is found at 873. How did we get this 873? We got this 873 from the hash function. So John Smith is the key. Like for example, say, uh, I am saying select star uh, from employee. I said select star from employee where uh, employee name, e name is equal to John Smith. Okay, so I said John Smith. Now what happened? The e name is John Smith. So this is the key, right? So I said e name is John Smith. So e name is passed into hash function and it is giving me 873. So 873 index, so I'm directly going. That's why it is order of one time complex. I'm not doing searching other ones. Directly I'm going to 873 and after 873, I'll find the record of John's. So I said star, right? So the entire record will be uh, printed to me on the screen. So this is how the hash tables are used. Applications of hash tables. Data stored in databases are generally is generally of the key value format, which is done through hash tables. Every time we keep something uh, to be searched in Google, Chrome, or other browsers, it generates the desired output based on the principle of hashing. And it is used in security, cryptography, hash tables are used. Uh, so in our computers, we have various files stored in it, and each file has two uh, very crucial information, that is file name and file path, and all these are placed in the hash tables. What are the different hash functions? So hash functions, uh, hash function can be numerical, uh, can take numerical key or alphanumerical key. If it is taking alphanumerical numerical key, then the ASCII value of that uh, particular uh, alphabet can be considered. Alphabetical letter can be considered. After processing, it generates the hash value. So this is the hash function. Uh, so the hash function will take the key and it will generate the index okay where you can find the record uh, so these are all the various uh, uh, hash function methods the division method multiplication method mid square method and folding method what is collusion okay so collusion occurs when hash function maps two different keys to the same location two records cannot save in the same location right so that's why we need to resolve this uh, collusion so how do you resolve this collision? So you have collision resolution techniques. Uh, the first one is open addressing and second one is by separate chaining. Open addressing uses probing, meaning that examining the next available locations and all that in the hash table. And uh, open addressing can be implemented using uh, these techniques like linear probing, quadratic probing, double hashing and rehashing. Uh, and the other collision resolution technique is separate chaining where the linked list is maintained. What are type of recursions? The type of recursions are linear recursion, binary recursion, and tail recursion. 
Uh, so the linear recursion means that there is something to be done after uh, the recursive calls. Binary recursion where two recursion, recursive calls are made at the same time. Tail recursion where nothing is left out after the recursive call. So these are the types of recursion. What is the maximum number of nodes in a binary tree of height k? The maximum number of nodes are 2 power k plus 1 minus 1, where k is greater than or equal to 1, where k is the height. What is Huffman coding algorithm? Huffman coding is a technique of compressing data to reduce its size without losing any of the details. So that is Huffman coding algorithm. And it was first developed by David Huffman. Uh, it came, the name came upon from the name of the uh, creator. So Huffman coding uh, is generally generally useful to compress the data. Okay, so in, in which there are frequently occurring characters. So for doing this Huffman uh, coding, we need a priority queue. So priority queue is used for building the Huffman tree such that nodes with the lowest frequency have the highest priority. So a min heap data structure can be used to implement the functionality of the priority queue. So in the Huffman coding algorithm, we use a priority queue. In turn, the priority queue is implemented uh, by a min heap. What is the difference between tree and graph data structure? Tree and graph are differentiated by the fact that the tree structure must be connected and can never have loops. Whereas in graph, there are no restrictions like this. Graph can have cycles. Tree provides insight on relationship between the nodes in a hierarchical manner and graph follows a network model. What is topological sort in a graph? Topological sort is the linear ordering of vertices such that for every directed edge ij, vertex i comes before vertex j in the order. Okay, so topological sort is only possible for the DAG, which is directed acyclic graph. And the applications of the topological sort are job scheduling from the given dependencies among jobs, ordering the formula, uh, cell evaluation in spreadsheets, and ordering of compilation tasks to be performed in. Uh, uh, make files and uh, data serialization and resolving simple de dependencies in the linkers. Okay, that's it friends. Uh, I hope uh, this video is helpful to you. I made it a point that I discuss all the topics from the data structures and it is a one place destination for you to learn uh, all the concepts in a single stretch. Uh, so I hope this video will help you in your interviews and also um, uh, in your examinations. Uh, please let me know, like if you're having any queries, uh, please let me know in the comment section. And also if you want any further topics to be made, uh, uh, to be made, uh, let me know even that topics in the comment section. Uh, it would be pleasure uh, helping you in building your career. I wish you all the best uh, for your interviews and for your upcoming examinations. Thank you for watching.